20. And in any event, I'll get started so we can get to our panelists. Um, so again, welcome everyone to Ask the Experts. I'm Catherine Leon. I'm a 17-year SCAD survivor, and I'm co-founder and board chair of SCAD Alliance and a member of the iSCAD Registry Steering Committee. If you're new to SCAD Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization founded by survivors in partnership with leading cardiologists and health advocates, and we advocate and advance the science of SCAD. In addition to our independent multi-center ISCAD registry, one of our main goals is to support patients and their families. And as part of that, we've developed this monthly webinar series. Um, we hope to offer support and education to survivors and caregivers by engaging in conversation with experts on SCAD-related topics each month. So I'm personally excited to host Ask the, S Ask the Experts today for several reasons. Um, regular viewers will realize that Nasha Parks and Rebecca Freeman are the two seasoned hosts, <laughs> but I wanted to participate for some personal reasons. Um, first, my own emergency room experience during my SCAD in 2003. Um, I was the classic woman in the ER with chest pain. I was sent home with the, you know, the quote, anxious, gassy woman diagnosis, even though I had a 90% blockage of my left main artery and I ended up having double bypass surgery. Um, a second reason that I'm excited for this panel today is my great admiration for Dr. Allison McGregor. I knew of her first from her TED talk on the subject of sex and gender bias in medicine, and next is a key figure in the documentary Misdiagnosed the Film, which is directed and produced by Tricia Reagan. Um, I had the honor of telling my story in Misdiagnosed as an example of what, Ms. what Dr. McGregor's work aims to correct. Um, and it was a wonderful experience, and we did have a premiere earlier in the year. Um, it kind of got COVIDed, <laughs> so hopefully it will be restarted and you all will get to see it someday in your cinema. But in her new book, Sex Matters, How Male-Centric Medicine Endangers Women's Health and What We Can Do About It, um, Dr. McGregor is highlighting for survivors like us and all women um, the fact that chest pain, heart attack, it is not all in our heads and we are not in our alone in our fight for equal equitable health care. So as we begin, I think you'll find this intriguing and hopefully uplifting and inspiring and give you some hope as a SCAD survivor. Dr. McGregor is Associate Professor excuse me, of Emergency Medicine and the co-founder and director for the Division of Sex and Gender and Emergency Medicine at Brown University's Department of Emergency Medicine. We're also excited to have Dr. Basma Safdar here for our conversation. Um, as many survivors in the audience can relate to, the struggle with ongoing and often untreated chest pain is real. It isn't in our heads, it's in our chests. <laughs> Dr. Safdar's work focuses on women's chest pain specifically, and her research also supports the struggles of SCAD survivors, many of whom may have other diagnoses such as microvascular disease. Dr. Safdar is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Yale and Director of the Yale New Haven Hospital Chest Pain Center. She's a nationally recognized clinical researcher in sex and gender-specific cardiovascular health, and she's um, focused on developing better diagnostics and treatment of underdiagnosed causes of persistent chest pain. And then our third panelist is someone near and dear to the hearts of SCAD Alliance, it's Dr. Sahara Nadari, who has extensive experience caring for the physical and emotional health of SCAD patients. Um, she's now Director of Women's Heart Health at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco and manages a thriving SCAD practice. Dr. Nadari is the Principal Investigator of the iSCAD Registry Site for Kaiser Northern California and serves in the leadership of the SCAD Alliance Scientific Advisory Board and the iSCAD Registry Steering Committee. Today she will lead the question and answer period um, after we have our presentations from Dr. McGregor and Dr. Savdar. You know, one quick we say this every time um, because there's not a 
ton of data yet on SCAD and specifically in the ER. You know, what we're telling you today is there are guidelines and all of this type of research is something that we hope to address through the ISCAD registry. Um, these are based on the opinions of the experts that we know around the country, but you always need to go back to your own doctor and discuss your individual care. Um, so in any event, this ISCAD registry gives us a lot of hope. We've enrolled over 400 patients in just a year and a half. So we feel like we're well on the way to finding some answers for everybody. Um, I'm going to turn everything over to our panelists because I know that's who you really want to hear from. And I'm going to pop over to Facebook and see if I can get that fixed for our audience there. So Dr. McGregor, if you're ready, you can launch sure. your slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And Thank you to SCAD Alliance, uh, not only for hosting this webinar, but for creating an organization that so many people with uh, this particular disorder um, can come together and, um, and share their stories because it just takes such a long time to get diagnosed. And I'm sure there's lots of, um, uh, you know, um, stress and emotional and physical um, uh, detriments because of it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I will um, share my screen now. And I did practice that. Okay. Okay. So um, as uh, was mentioned, I directed Division of Sex and Gender in Emergency Medicine at Brown University. And I um, am, okay, let's do the slides this way. So um, I know that SCAD has been doing these webinars and having a different focus. And this one is really about the emergency department. Um, and that's where I, you know, handle all of my clinical work. And it's really an important place. Everyone is um, in a sort of sense of crisis, right? No matter what they're there for, they had to stop what they're doing and come get checked out. And I thought it would be really important to share with you why we may not have the right thing to say or the right diagnostic test uh, to diagnose this condition. So, um, and many other conditions as well. So if you think about it, um, we were taught, like when we are undergoing our education to be a healthcare provider and to work in the emergency department, we were taught that men and women were about the same, except for their reproductive organs. Um, and so that everything else was fairly, um, transferable, but we now know that this is not the truth and that, you know, th just thinking of almost 80% of those with autoimmune conditions are women and the way that uh, heart failure um, occurs now, the mechanisms are different between men and women. Um, women have migraines and irritable bowel and these things are not just related to the fact that we have different reproductive organs. It's much more um, integral into our physiology than that. And the reason why this was missed was because when we started really doing research on human subjects, um, there were no rules. And so there was a lot of um, um, experiments that weren't uh, informed consent. Um, and that included uh, conditions where women would be, um, uh, take part of a study and become pregnant. And there were some really um, bad reactions from that. And so that's what prompted the National Research Act, um, which said that we should really have informed consent. There needs to be a committee that approves that you can do this research, but also let's just protect women of childbearing age and let's just exclude them from research so that we can really uh, make sure that nothing happens um, untoward them. And so what was the result of that? Well, the result of that is that women weren't excluded from all research. 
uh, for the most part. And research was performed on men and male animals. And this was really embraced at that time because it was discovered that, well, it's easier to research men um, because they don't have the fluctuating menstrual cycle and they don't have the hormones that could interfere with the results. So this was really embraced and it's the um, basis for which our understanding of disease is, is upon. Because if we were starting to really learn about heart attacks and strokes, and infections and cancer, we were studying all of those conditions in men. Um, and so what happened is when we couldn't study giving birth or menstruation in men, we studied those in women. And what it did was it really sort of trapped all of the efforts to providing medical care for women into just those issues. So I'm sure many people on, you know, who are watching this now um, when they think about what's their greatest health concern prior to knowing about SCAD or even um, experiencing it, unfortunately, is breast cancer, right? So these are the things that we were thought to, um, you know, to, to think about, worry about in our own bodies if you are a woman. But cardiovascular disease, we now know, is the number one killer for both men and women. And even cancer, lung cancer, is the number one cancer death for women. So all in all, by trying to protect women, this is what happened. When you think about it, we have a different biological sex. So females are born with the chromosomal complement of XX, and males are born with XY. And there are some uh, variations in between, that's a, a small percent. And these chromosomes are in every cell in our bodies. So they are actually in your heart. They're in your coronary arteries. They are affecting the way that disease presents itself. It's in your lungs and affecting how COVID may respond to you. It's in your liver and your kidneys and it's responsible for how you're metabolizing drugs. And so now we're realizing how important this really is from the cellular level on up. And about those hormones that we've been ignoring and not really figuring out how they affect our health and disease, they also have major impacts. Um, they um, affect cerebral blood flow. They also turn on enzymes or off if you're um, taking medication. And they actually do affect the uh, connective tissue around the arteries. Um, and so it's time to embrace the complexity of these issues. And I like to just also mention our environment is gendered. Our relationship to our, our entire world is, um, um, can have impact on our health as well. For instance, um, I like to use this example of the crash test dummy. We have uh, four decades of data using crash test dummy um, without having a female uh, figure. Okay, so what has that done? Well, car manufacturers design their vehicles to pass these tests. And so if these tests are based on the male anatomy, um, then um, what's the result? The result is that women, if you're sitting in the front seat, you are 73% more likely to be injured seriously and 17% more likely to be killed. We have different um, pelvic uh, geometry because we're, we're, we're built to give birth. We uh, sit up closer to the dashboard. We have different neck muscle masses. So these are the things that um, our society, our medical knowledge, and our history have not taken into account. So if you look at cell-based researchers, they still do not even understand what the chromosomal complement is in that cell when they're studying it. 80% uh, of animal-based research is still in male models. Human clinical trials, yes, we are including women more often, but we're not analyzing it to look at these differences so that we can actually have actionable changes in our medical system. We know women make up over half of the population, and we know that they are the major healthcare deciders for the family. So this is the evidence that we are coming into when we show up at the emergency department, when you go to see your doctor. And so we were taught that this is what a heart attack looks and feels like, that a man is clutching his chest and that it's going to be very obvious. And this man is probably going to be a smoker and have high cholesterol and high blood pressure. But what we know now is that 
women <laughs> present differently, right? Women present with the shortness of breath or they're younger, especially with SCAD, right? They are nauseous or they have this unusual fatigue. This is not something that we were educated on recognizing and also on um, diagnostic testing and outcomes. And if you think about it, um, it's things like microvascular disease, um, another disease of the small arteries around the heart. Um, it was known that this was a small percentage of uh, occurrence in men, maybe four to 10% of men have microvascular disease. Now we know it's anywhere upwards of 40 to 60% in women. And so what was considered small and rare and when we're studying men, we're now realizing that they may, that may not be the case in women and that's um, true for SCAD. So I looked at the Facebook feed and um, I realized um, that this is going to be very familiar to many of you. This seems to be your experience. So you come into the emergency department and you're describing some chest discomfort. Not classic pain, um, it might be sharp, it might uh, also you might be feeling a little short of breath, um, but you describe it differently. And, um, and you're anxious because you just had to wait many hours, you are in the emergency department, it's not a very uh, comfortable place if you're not in healthcare. And you had to leave work or leave your family. And so you might be a little anxious. And so the doctor usually will look at you and say, oh, you're anxious, right? So here's some Valium, right? So right off, you might be you know, crying and a little uh, worked up because of all the issues that you're concerned about. And so they give you something to relax you. And now you're relaxed, right? You're pretty relaxed, but your symptoms are still there. So then they'll look at your chart and they'll say, oh, well, you have um, GERD, you have that reflux, you have acid reflux, right? So this is probably just that. You're too young, you don't have many other risk factors. So let's give you the Maalox and lidocaine mixture that uh, people find helpful. And when that doesn't work, then it's, um, well, it's tender when I press, so maybe this is musculoskeletal, so let's try the ibuprofen. Um, and then you're like, okay, it's not really helping. Um, so then the doctor says, well, let's just get you feeling better while I wait for some lab work and they'll give you some morphine without realizing that women have higher uh, incidences of respiratory depression and nausea and vomiting. And so now you're having all these medications and now you start vomiting. So now you need something for nausea. And then finally, the doctor says, well, perhaps we should get that EKG or get that biomarker troponin. Maybe we should give you a nitroglycerin. And then you are maybe finally put on the path of looking at whether this is a cardiovascular event. This is what you're hearing while you're sitting there. You are hearing that this is all in your head. You are hearing that, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you could be pregnant. Maybe it's just stress. Um, maybe you're, you know, perimenopausal. Maybe it's your period coming up. Um, and so many women are misdiagnosed every year. I'm thankful that I could uh, showcase my book um, with this group because one of the things that I do is go over historically, not just cardiovascular disease and the differences between men and women, but so many other conditions that really um, become uh, very uh, at the forefront of emergency care. Now, Dr. Safdar is going to talk about what to expect uh, that should be ordered um, if you come in with chest discomfort, and then um, we will, uh, you know, we can always come back and I will um, love to share with you how you can um, really sort of advocate for yourself for this condition and many other conditions that um, you might be experiencing um, in the healthcare system. So I will stop sharing from there and um, uh, hand the baton over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Safdar. Thank you, Allison. It's always wonderful to, I've heard this, uh, some pieces of your conversation so many times, this is always impressive to, to actually, and jarring to actually look at this data again and how do we miss coming to this point and how much work we have to do. So thank you for putting that work out there. So I think one of the questions that had come up was, what should you expect when you come to the emergency department? And I thought um, I can answer it from a 
couple of uh, ways. One is what are we thinking in the emergency department when we, when you are presenting to triage with chest pain, what is, what are the thoughts that are going through our mind and, and in your, and, and then flip it to see what you should expect uh, when you are presenting with a heart attack. So when someone is coming, if you present to the, to emergency department with chest pain, the things that are thinking, you know, going through our mind as a team, whether it's the triage nurse or the emergency physician, is to make sure that we rule out all the life-threatening causes of heart attack, of, of, of chest pain. And that includes things like, you know, things that typically we think about is your, your, it's not a heart attack, which is the number one leading cause of death for both men and women in the U.S., but other less common things, but also more common in women like blood clots, um, the aortic dissection, which is ripping of the ear of the big artery that comes out of your heart. Um, other emergencies that are associated with esophagus, which is the tube, the feeding tube that goes right behind the heart and can sometimes mimic the symptoms of chest pain. Um, so kind of bad things and also surgical things like gallbladder, which is right next to the heart um, uh, or, and, and any liver pathology. And as we're doing that, we use some thought process, some risk stratification, like what are the things that put you at risk for one or more of these conditions, and then some diagnostic tests. Now, heart attacks is clearly the number one thing that we are thinking about any time people are coming with chest pain. And what is interesting is Allison touched upon it, but not everybody who comes to the emergency department has read the textbook, the medical textbook. So they're not saying they have chest pain. They will say, oh, I have some, something going on here or some discomfort. They use other terms. And women tend to use different terms than men. Um, they often will say, I just have some pressure or some discomfort or something like that. So I have changed the way I ask people uh, to kind of pinpoint that, that definition of chest pain. But when people come in with uh, chest pain, uh, what, they, what we, they should expect is, in terms of heart attack, is um, to get an EKG or the electrocardiogram within 10 minutes. Because one of the big things that the emergency teams should be doing is to make sure that you're not having one of the life-threatening type of heart attack, which is the SD elevation MI. And SCAD is... Uh, is interesting in the sense that many, many of SCAD women actually do present with ST elevation MI, which in general is not the predominant type of heart attack, but it is the type of heart attack that we, that when time becomes of essence, like we have to move very, very quickly in order to make sure that we recognize it and we treat it. So, um, so when you're coming in through triage and seeing what you have, uh, whether you see a chest pain or chest discomfort, then what typically would happen is that you should get an EKG, you should immediately be seen to get at least get an EKG. That EKG is taken to an emergency physician to be read to make sure you don't have the ST elevation MI or heart attack. And then you may be asked to be brought to a room based on whether you have space or not, or be brought back into um, to the waiting room. And then at some point, you when you are assessed, and that should fairly be pretty soon, uh, especially if there's any changes on your EKG. Um, then the additional tests that can happen are blood tests, particularly something called troponin, which is uh, one of the diagnostic tests of heart attacks. It takes some time to release troponin, even if you have chest pain uh, and a heart attack. So what we typically would do, serial blood tests. If you have ST elevation MI, it's actually fairly straightforward. You should be taken inside immediately and within about half an hour, um, you, you, you actually get a lot of attention uh, because you're going to get uh, assessment treatments and a cat lab activation so that the cardiology team will come in and kind of ship you up to actually do an angiography within half an hour. And that goal is actually not just from, it, it is, it's, it should, it's pretty standard goal in terms of um, um, meeting the metrics of, of how to take good care of heart attacks. That only is about 5% of heart attacks we see. So the rest of the times, we're actually doing these serial blood tests. And if they are ruled, if you ruled out for a heart attack, you have an option of, based on your risk stratification, you have an option of going to an observation unit called chest pain center. It's one of the, it's like it, or be admitted to the hospital, where you may expect to get a stress test. 
Um, and then if that's cleared, you really ruled out for all forms of heart attacks and you'll go home. Um, and that is typically, that pathway is typically dealt with when we are, uh, we have ruled out all the initial early causes of heart, of, of chest pains, which, which were the, some of the other things I had talked about. So I think that's what, that's what you would expect to see. And from your standpoint, if you're coming in, if you have been there for half an hour and you haven't had an EKG with chest pain, it's fairly reasonable to ask uh, the nurse uh, or, or, and remind them, are you going to get an EKG? Because it's a low hanging fruit, it's a, it's a test that we do all the time. And then I'll come back to it in terms of just in terms of perspective of how often we do that um, when, when, we've, well, we've, when we've had, we're addressing some of the other questions. But it's a fairly um, uh, common test that you can expect to, um, to ask for. And if you're really unsure of uh, whether you're getting adequate attention and whether you think it truly is a heart attack and you're worried about it, you can always ask whether there will be any blood tests for a heart attack. So I will stop there. And uh, I'll, I'll let Sahar take it on uh, in terms of how to elaborate further on the questions that uh, you, you, you were going to address. Great. Thanks, Dr. Safdar. So um, hi, everybody. It's really good to see everyone in the virtual world. Um, for those of you who are braving the fires in California, our thoughts are with you. Um, I pulled down my blinds so you wouldn't be depressed by the San Francisco um, weather. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and um, let's see here. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Okay, great. So I'm going to talk very briefly just about um, initial emergency room presentations and then follow up emergency room presentations and try to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and for any of you out there who are my patients, you know that when we first meet, which is often after your SCAD diagnosis, sometimes in the hospital, but sometimes afterwards, um, the main question you have is, how do I know some of these residual symptoms I'm having are my vessel healing versus a new event versus and or something I should continue to be worried about enough to go back to the emergency room to get checked out? And you'll know, and I think most of you out there will know that oftentimes, unfortunately, your physicians don't have a great answer to that. I can't really give you this very specific list of things that should drive you to go get checked out in the ER versus give me a call. And so we oftentimes tell you to be frank, to listen to your body. If you feel like something's not right, your gut's telling you just like it did the last time that something was um, awry, then it's better safe than sorry um, to get checked out. Um, and I know that's super vague and nonspecific and our hope with all the work everyone is doing is that we will be able to get a little bit more specific and give more, more and better guidance. But I don't want anyone out there to feel discouraged when your doctors seem a little bit unsure about the exact advice to give you in terms of whether you should go to the emergency room or not. So um, I think Dr. McGregor and Dr. Safdar will tell you that the hard part is the diagnosis of SCAD with the initial presentation. I will tell you that from a cardiologist standpoint, it's not that sometimes the SCAD diagnosis initially can be challenging because it can, but it's really the subsequent symptoms um, that are very challenging for us. So we'll talk through that a little bit. Um, with your initial ER presentation, so while we, while we always stress that um, women do present differently than men, I wanna reemphasize that about 90% of SCAD patients will present with some sort of chest pain or chest discomfort or chest pressure. So it is in the vast majority of patients the most common symptom. Now, in the patients who do not present with chest pain, pressure, or discomfort, you're more likely to be a woman to present with the symptoms we don't typically think about versus a man. But just to be clear, chest pain is present in the vast majority of our SCAD patients. And then if you believe the studies we've done thus far, the other symptoms we commonly see in order of frequency is radiation to the arm, followed by nausea and vomiting, followed by radiation to the neck, followed by sweating, shortness of breath, back pain, dizziness, heart rhythm issues like palpitations, skipped beats, fatigue, headache, and very rarely passing out. 
Um, one caveat is that obviously our data is not as robust as we'd hope it would be because historically when these um, studies came out, um, SCAD was much rarer in terms of the patients we had to study. And so there is some argument that this might not be completely accurate. Um, but it still gives a gist for what the initial presentation often is. Um, we do say almost universally present is an elevated troponin. Now, if you do present with an ST elevation myocardial infarction, like Dr. Safdar said, the initial troponin may not be positive, but the EKG is going to tell them that something's awry. And the patients where the EKG is, you know, a little bit abnormal or looks completely normal, that's when the troponin or the blood marker for a heart attack is very helpful to us. One thing to remember is that troponin levels become positive a few hours after initial symptoms. So your first troponin may be normal. And that's why we often keep you for a couple of troponins, oftentimes two to three, depending on the assay that's available at the emergency room um, to ensure that we're not missing something there. Um, so that, those are, that's kind of the short and dirty on initial emergency room presentation. And then subsequent presentations, we know from just all of us who see a lot of SCAD patients, all of you out there listening to this know this, um, it's unfortunately extremely common to come end up back in the emergency room after an initial SCAD event. And we know that more than half of our SCAD patients um, do end up back in the ER within the first few weeks to month of their SCAD diagnosis. There's a lot of challenge um, for you as the patient and for us as the physician here. Um, oftentimes, it's very hard for me to know, is that dissection or tear spasming as it's healing and that's why you're having that chest discomfort after your initial diagnosis or is that tear extending or are you having a new event depending on the timing um, after the initial event and i think that's why it's so challenging when new symptoms arise to know what to do and so we often err on the side of recommending you go back to the emergency room just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, symptoms can range from chest pain, discomfort, pressure, similar to the SCAD event, to new, patient, to new symptoms that do not include the chest discomfort. And that adds another layer of challenge, right? When you've had a very traumatic event, such as a heart attack, you're obviously much more acutely aware of every symptom that might arise after that event. So oftentimes differentiating between whether you're having another SCAD event or again, extension of an initial tear or spasm related to the dissection or there's something else going on um, that's unrelated is often very, very difficult to tease out. And that's why we often tell you to go back into the ER to get blood work for another troponin and a repeat EKG. Um, my patients often ask, well, can't you just check the troponin as an outpatient? Um, and the reason I spend a lot of time educating our primary care doctors, because as a cardiologist, we almost never do this unless it's not for heart attack reasons, um, is because it's kind of poor form to check a troponin and then call the patient the next day and say, hey, last night your labs came back while I was sleeping and your blood markers were abnormal. So it's almost universally done in the ER. Um, now, if the symptoms are kind of somewhere in between needing to go back to the ER and reassuring, then we'll sometimes do a stress test. And how do we decide what kind of testing we do and when we send you to the ER is your gut feeling and our gut feeling of what makes sense. Um, and I know that's, a, again, super vague, but it's pretty much as good as we've got to go on um, at this point. And the troponin and the EKG can reassure you and reassure your doctors um, that another acute event is not happening. But I wanna emphasize that the work is not done when everything checks out in the ER, right? Just because you go back to the ER and everything checks out okay, doesn't mean that the chest discomfort you're having is you know, dismissible or not important or shouldn't be looked into further. Um, so that's when you hop back in with your cardiologist to say, hey, so what are we going to do now? You know, everything checked out okay. Nothing acute was happening to me. 
but what are we going to do now to get me chest pain free? And I know there are a lot of people out there that still battle with angina long term, um, but we try our best with medications and other modalities to get you chest pain free if we can. So I want to stress that if everything checks out in the ER, it doesn't mean you don't circle back with your docs to say, hey, I'm still having symptoms. What can we do about it? Um, and then the other thing I want to stress is um, you kind of learn to know your body over the months after your new body, some people call it, after the initial diagnosis. And we learn along with you. I think my SCAD patients that have been with me for a long time, over the years, I get better at teasing out what's concerning, what is not concerning, and again, what's kind of in a gray zone where we need to do some outpatient testing. And I think you will feel the same way. I think after a few months after the initial diagnosis, it seems hard to imagine that you'll kind of get a feel for when things are awry and when they're not. Um, but usually you and your partner cardiologist and physician team kind of sort out as you go um, when things become when things are more acute and when they're not. It's just the initial couple of months as you're getting to know this body and we're getting to know you, it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that. I'm going to um, stop sharing. Um, and I was going to um, start by um, going through some questions. So um, I'll kind of hop back and forth between Dr. Safdar and Dr. McGregor and try to periodically take a look at this chat um, and um, make sure there's not any active questions coming in from Facebook. So excuse me if I look like my eyes are darting all over the place. Um, so Dr. McGregor, um, I, we hear this question so often and it's a bit heartbreaking um, and I'd like to think that it's happening less and less as the years go on, but I, I know it's still happening. So um, oftentimes patients are getting dismissed as having anxiety after having a SCAD event. So patients have already had their SCAD event, come back in with chest discomfort, pain, pressure, other symptoms, and are told, well, you had a heart attack, so it's understandable you're feeling really anxious about it. So how can patients advocate for themselves and ensure they're getting the appropriate workup and follow-up after an initial SCAD diagnosis? That's a great question. Make sure I'm, I'm, I'm not on mute. Um, uh, it's true. and. Um, I think one of the th um, key things that I would tell patients to do is to have an advocate, either bring one or be one for someone else. It's a little bit challenging in today's COVID-19 world where we're so um, used to um, uh, enjoying the fact that family members are there and helping us piece together the puzzle, but we will call anybody that you want us to. And I find that that's really helpful for the anxiety component because um, when you are anxious about the fact that this is your new body, I really liked that, that phrase. Um, uh, cause we see a lot of people that once they've had something very serious, um, they do come back in again because it's, it's, it's frightening. Um, and so once you, um, say that, yes, I am anxious that this might be happening to me. Um, some, an advocate can say, well, this isn't her anxiety. She doesn't, you know, she might have a history of anxiety, but it doesn't look like this. It doesn't present like this. They can be your, um, uh, that, that other voice that, that, that's in there. The other thing I would say is to keep in mind in the emergency department, um, we are meeting you for the first time probably the first and the last time. And we have to get to know you very quickly. Um, and so be very uh, clear about what your goals are for the visit. Uh, we cannot read your minds. Some of us uh, are good at that, but most of us are not. And so if you are there, say very specifically, I just had a heart attack. Um, I'm afraid it's happening again. I'm not sure if it's because I'm anxious about the fact that I recently had a heart attack, but what can we do to ensure it's not happening again today? And you start this conversation where the physician in the emergency department knows what you're concerned about. You should look at your physician as a very well-informed consultant. Um, and so be very open about your questions, about your needs, about your symptoms, um, and, and be willing to have that conversation um, uh, very direct and very openly and, um, and feel free to 
bring in uh, some team members. I think that's really, really wonderful. And then a follow-up question, wonderful advice. A follow-up question is, um, this is a really common one. I think um, a lot of folks don't want to start off the physician-patient relationship, particularly when you're meeting someone for the first and potentially the last time, to be offensive, but um, you also want them to understand the urgency of your diagnosis. So what do you do if they've never heard of SCAD? Or how do you approach things if you don't know if they've ever heard of SCAD? It's, um, it's for me? Okay, sure. Yes, yeah, so um, I think it's just like everything else. So much data is now coming out that shows women may have different forms in physiology of disease and different presentations and response to different um, uh, medications. And so here is the opportunity for women to uh, help change the system from within. So if you feel as though that your doctor has never heard of SCAD, which is, is it's possible. I mean, it really is. Um, feel free to say, look, this is something that I've had. I've had this dissection. So if you say heart attack, or if you say my artery had a dissection, those are key words for physicians and they'll plug it in. Um, just likewise, if you look up something on Google, if you consult Google, you consult your cardiologist before coming in, be very open about that discussion. It's okay to teach your doctor something that they may not know. Um, in fact, we're counting on it. Um, doctors inherently for the majority went into this field to help people. And we have this understanding that science and medicine and our understanding of it evolves. We know this. We look at things that we've done 10, you know, five years ago and we're like, I can't believe we were doing that. Um, and so we evolve. And for the most part, we are looking to have a better understanding of uh, your condition and uh, updated science and so um, I would encourage you to be open to have these conversations. I think that's great. And then Dr. Safter, I think you had some recommendations for um, how to phrase your diagnosis in the ER to help physicians who may not quite know what SCAD is um, and how to kind of impress upon the person you're meeting. And perhaps the first person you're meeting is not your doc, right? It's gonna be the nurse who's gonna then trigger things. So um, what are some ways, tools you can use to kind of stress the urgency of the matter? Sure, so I think uh, one, uh, just having a history of a heart attack is something that will catch any nurses or uh, physicians attention right away. Uh, when I talked about, you know, when people come in, there's, we have these protocols to do EKG within 10 minutes for people with chest pain. Um, now, for an emergency department where, like ours, where we see 120,000 patients a year, you can't do it on every single patient. So you actually, there are protocols that are set in place for people um, who may be at higher risk. And so among those people who are maybe at higher risk that the EKG is done right away, are people with a good story, which uh, as Dr. McGregor had pointed out was like the classic chest pain of the man having a heart attack. Um, or if you have risk factors like prior heart attack, high blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, diabetes, um, uh, or any of those, or, or any peripheral vascular disease. And so if you say you have had a prior heart attack, I think it'll catch the attention of anyone um, who is seeing you for chest pain. Um, I would probably keep it simple. Uh, SCAD is a very, very specific, unusual diagnosis of the types of heart attack. And so let alone doctors, many nurses would not know, and that will probably be the first person you're seeing. So I would, instead of saying SCAD, we'll probably say a heart attack from SCAD or heart attack from dissection, but I had a heart attack. And maybe just keep it very simple. Um, and that will get you an EKG, which is like the first thing to do. And then when you have an opportunity to your doctor to speak with your doctor, you can see you had a heart attack from SCAD. And I think that that will get the attention of anyone. If they didn't know that, they will look it up. I think that's really good advice. Um, I think, you know, we've all been there where we've been like, one moment, and then we <laughs> left and looked something up 
yeah. and come back. So, you know, that's okay as long as I think it triggers the appropriate cascade. Um, so along those lines, a lot of patients ask, when I come into the emergency room, what can I bring with me to empower my me to educate those around me? Um, that's one part of the question. The other part is, you know, what should I say on a medical bracelet? Do you guys think it's helpful for in the emergency room to have a medical bracelet? Um, those kinds of things. What resources should I bring with me? So when I'm assessing somebody young with chest pain um, who wouldn't traditionally have a heart attack, um, and if they have an abnormal EKG, the thing that's most helpful to me is either the story of a prior heart attack or their prior EKG. So if they had an abnormal EKG before, I often will tell them to take a picture on their smartphones or if they have access to it. And, and that is very helpful for comparison to see if there's something is changing. Um, I would also say, I think people should take um, the time to write down their symptoms when they had their first heart attack, to like really take the time, discuss with their family member they talk to or the cardiologist or the physician to really document what were the symptoms that were at the time of heart attack. Because, you know, as you know and see, very often heart attack symptoms may be different for men and women, may be different um, between patients, but they're often the same. For the same patient. And as you said, knowing your body and knowing what your heart attack symptoms are is very, very important. And so I would say if people can remember and take the time to remember their, uh, their symptoms, and if they feel distressed that they can't they, they communicate all of that, then maybe have it in writing or have some family member who know what the heart attack symptoms are. That will always ring a bell in my, in, like, like will be a red flag in my mind when I'm assessing somebody with chest pain to see how seriously I should take their symptoms. Dr. McGregor, in terms of that, do you have any other suggestions? And then another part of that question is, you know, there's a lot of things that often happened between um, calling an ambulance and getting to the emergency room. And so sometimes the EMS or the emergency medical services are the front line. So that's a whole different beast um, in terms of educating the super frontline folks who come um, to uh, respond to a 911 call. Do you have any suggestions for how to manage that? Um, yeah, that's um, so funny because it just reminds me of a story of my mother. Um, she was at a public uh, place and she was feeling sweaty and a little uncomfortable. And my dad went and grabbed uh, someone and said, my wife's not feeling well. And they had an EMS person um, on scene and the EMS person came up to her, my mother and said, are you having chest pain? Is it crushing chest pain to your chest? And does it feel like an elephant? And my mother looked at him and said, that's how men have heart attacks. I'm a woman. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, mom, thank you so much for that. So yes, we're educating everybody. And I think um, this, you know, they're trained just like the nursing uh, nurses trained, just like the doctors trained. Um, they, they understand basic um, concerns. I had a heart attack. I am, you know, um, uh, I'm concerned that that's what's happening now. What I, what I find that what happens is the women delay calling because they are sitting at home thinking, well, this isn't normal for me. And this isn't how I've heard that heart attacks feel. So there's a delay to that particular first 911 call that we want to shorten. Um, most EMS people will bring you to the emergency department, so that, that should be okay. They shouldn't be talking you out of, of getting checked out. Um, and then just to echo some of the things that Dr. Softar was saying, um, your phone is an incredible uh, medical record device. So take photos of your prescription models. Take photos of reports of, um, you know, if you've had a stress test for your heart or if you had an, um, you know, anything like that. Um, you know, it's that way it will always be there for you because you may not think ahead of time that you're going to be in the emergency department this afternoon. So keeping track of your own medical record is so important um, because so a lot of times patients will come in and they'll say, I'm not feeling well. Um, and then I say, well, do you have any medical problems? And they say no. And I'm like, what's that huge scar on your chest? You've had open heart surgery. Like this is 
Um, write it all down. You don't have to necessarily understand it. Um, have your uh, physician, either your primary care doctor, your specialist, help you put together some, something um, as well as the symptoms. And just come in and say, can, you know, if you could read this, don't, you know, don't feel bad about that. I actually am like, oh, thank you. And I, I, I find, you know, the more information I can elicit um, uh, in an emergent situation when there's, you know, there's a lot on the line and we're very busy, the, the, the help, more helpful it is. I think that's really great advice. Um, a couple of things I'll add is um, you can print out um, information from the SCAD Alliance website. I often tell patients to do that and take that to the emergency room with them. Um, I usually um, will message my patients a one-liner. We like to call it in medicine about your medical history that you can just, here's the quick and dirty on what my cardiologist says has happened to me. Um, and that usually is really helpful. The other thing I'm a big advocate of is the medical bracelet, mainly in the rare situation that you're not able to speak to your, for yourself. Most of our SCAD patients are young or younger, healthy looking women. And, you know, we know there's implicit bias, um, especially in this climate, you know, everyone talks about it. So people's gut reaction is based on what they see in front of them. And so oftentimes the first thought is not gonna be this young, healthy looking woman had a heart attack. So I think the medical bracelet or some sort of medical identifier oftentimes will trigger a cascade that may not have been triggered um, normally. And that's really if there's no one there that can advocate for you. Um, so I wanted to leave plenty, I, I, I was kind of hoping we would use the whole hour and not mention COVID more than once, but I know we need to talk about this. So um, the, a lot of folks out there wanna know, am I really okay going to the ER during COVID-19? I'm obviously afraid of the implications of going in with everything going on. And this is open to both of you. Yeah, I think uh, we can talk about it at our, each of our institutions, but I think the precautions are similar in, in most institutions. and. I can talk about our institution. Uh, we have uh, several precautions in place in the sense of not just protecting the patients, but also protecting the staff who have to work there day in and day out. Um, so, you know, everybody's wearing masks and everybody's wearing gowns and for high risk procedures, even um, more gear to make sure that we minimize the, uh, the exposure. All patients have uh, masks as well. We are Taking, making sure the procedures that are done are done so that they minimize the risk of airborne infection. So I, I would say that it is really important that if somebody is experiencing chest pain to actually still seek care for that because um, a possibility of a life-threatening condition doesn't uh, equate, you know, clearly a life-threatening condition, um, uh, delaying the diagnosis of a life-threatening condition like a heart attack. So I would say it is much more important to actually go and get it checked out while, and assume that people are doing the precautions. And you can, I like, just like for the heart attack, you can also advocate for making sure that you're getting the protections um, for minimized exposure for COVID. So at our institution, in addition to the the gowns and, and, and the masks and everything, uh, as, as a result, of, there's a policy of not bringing visitors at this time just to minimize that exposure. Um, and which is in some ways as difficult as a physician, I'm sure as a patient, but it is you know, the, the step we have taken in order to minimize um, a, you know, additional people in the ER. And uh, a lot of times that the um, patients who look like they're symptomatic with COVID-19 are cohorted in different areas of the emergency department. Um, that's the case for my um, hospital because we're so large, we're able to do that. And I know we're wrapping up and I just wanted to also add, you know, the messaging of don't go to the hospital um, during this pandemic was, was, was not quite right because yeah. what we um, what happened is people were avoiding coming to the hospital at all costs and you know we see like where are our patients with diabetes and high blood pressure and kidney failure um, just uh, at home with their chronic conditions that are getting worse now they're starting to show up and they've had you know um, uh, a big um, 
gap in their medical care and, you know, the prescriptions maybe have run out and that sort of thing. So there are protections in place. Everybody has to wear a mask. Um, so there's social distancing, family aren't allowed in the waiting room. So um, there's, there's, we're, we're doing the best we can to minimize any exposure. So I would encourage people to feel as though they can go to the emergency department to seek care at any time. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, we're using the same precautions. I think it's fairly universal that we're um, being incredibly vigilant and careful. And I think I told you guys when we were talking last week that I definitely feel more comfortable in the hospital than I do at the grocery store. So, and we all have to go to the grocery store. So I think um, use your judgment um, and kind of block out the fears of COVID and make sure you're doing the right thing for you outside of that. Um, I think we have like maybe one or two minutes. I want to see what you both think um, about what we can do as a medical profession as a whole to do better going forward, um, making sure that patients never feel like they're being dismissed with um, anxiety or just how do we decrease the bad experiences in the emergency room going forward? Well, I guess I can start. I mean, I think that um, was the impetus for me to do the research and launch the research career that I did, which was because I was seeing this pattern of women coming again and again and again with chest pains. And so, um, you know, my goal is that we put a lot more evidence out there and things like the SCAD Alliance and, and what you're doing with the um, registry is the kind of information we need in order to convince people, right? In order to make it evidence-based. So I do believe creating evidence and disseminating evidence through lectures, through didactics, through research papers, through symposiums and things and webinars like these is a place to start. Exactly. I think that everybody has a role. It's, it's, it's been a, um, a history of uh, in ignorance and, un uh, you know, and unknown, just un not realizing how important these significant differences are between men and women. So um, no matter what your role is, if you are a researcher, making sure that journals are, um, you know, uh, making sure that before it gets published through peer review and editorial, and if you're part of a, uh, a scientist group, if you're educating healthcare providers, make sure that that's part of the curriculum. Um, and if you're you know, at all in the clinical field, make sure that this becomes part of the discussion. I think that um, we all have a role to play here, even if we are, because we're all patients as well. So even if we're um, a patient with our physician and having that discussion, um, just to make sure that uh, awareness becomes uh, universal. And I would just add one more thing that when we talk about, you know, seeking care and, uh, you know, creating advocates, um, I, one of the things that we did, did as part of the Women's Heart Program outreach um, at Yale was we would teach the lay people, the people around the women. So it's so important to not just educate, you know, not just after the SCAD, but before the SCAD, not just you, but all your friends, your husbands, your sons, your fathers, and all the people around you who you will turn to when you're having the symptoms, and they are the ones who will tell you you have to go now. Love it. That's great. Catherine, thank you both so much. This has been fantastic. I'm going to hand it over to Catherine. I think you're muted, maybe. Yep, there we go. Thank you all so much. I loved listening. I was not in the ER getting my chest pain checked. <laughs> <laughs> my failed technology earlier, so I apologize for all the hiccups, <laughs> but live and learn, right? Um, no, thank you all so much. I enjoyed having each of you on, admire you very much, and um, everything you said just really hits home, and we're thrilled that we have the opportunity to put this on our YouTube so this will live um, forever, and we can share with our family and friends and our physicians and, and educate. I mean, that's really what it's about. Um, so to our guests out there, be sure to, I don't know if I can get this in the screen, but here oh, it is. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Gregor's book, which someday hopefully you'll sign for me. <laughs> I'd love to. 
And then we'll send a link out as well. If you haven't joined our um, e-newsletter list, um, there's a link for that on our Facebook. Um, or it's you can write to info at Scout Alliance and get information about us as well. But we'll send out links to the book, Ms. Diagnose the Film, um, and then, of course, to our clinical studies that are expanding across the U.S. We're super excited about ISCAD Registry, which now has 14 sites, and we're still growing. Wow. So again, yeah, so thank you all very much. And um, next month, we'll be discussing fibromuscular dysplasia with another group, uh, another great panel. Um, probably the first Friday of the month. I haven't booked it just yet, so stay tuned for more information on that. And again, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good seeing you. You too. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Sahar. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>